questions. So. All right. Okay, we're live. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Ben Gessner. Uh, before we start, I just want to say that uh, Minnesota is Dakota and Ojibwe homeland. Uh, it's centered within Dakota creation stories and is also an important place in traditional Ojibwe history and the histories of other Native nations. It is both an ancestral and contemporary home to many Native people. The idea of home and homelands plays a central role in our recently developed exhibit, Our Home, Native Minnesota. And I'd like to welcome you all to the sixth in a series of artists in the gallery programs. We are not in the gallery today. We're down in the lower level of the Minnesota History Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I also want to acknowledge that museums in many ways have played a role in cultural interruption for Native people and that it's our responsibility to acknowledge and work towards repairing that. So again, my name is Ben Gessner. I'm the curator of the Native Collections. And uh, today I'm gonna to be visiting with Bis Kakone, also known as Greg Johnson, who's uh, featured in the Our Home exhibit just slightly. I wish, I wish a little bit more and we're working on doing something uh, else about that. But um, he's visited, we visited a number of times in collections. Um, you're a language speaker, an instructor, an artist, and an educator. And today we're gonna be talking about uh, some traditional winter activities, uh, especially what they meant and what they mean to Ojibwe people. And uh, we'll be talking about cedar mat weaving, basket making, decoy making, ice fishing, ice spearing, um, all sorts of things today. So in the those of you in the audience, you can leave questions in the chat and uh, staff are moderating, moderating that space and we'll bring them up during the Q&A. All right, we're very glad that you're here today and we welcome you to join us each month as we listen to and learn from native artists, teachers and makers. All right, Ms. Kakone, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, my English name is Greg Johnson. I come from the Lac du Flambeau Ojibwe Reservation. Uh, it's kind of east, northeast of, of Minneapolis. Uh, it's in Wisconsin. And um, I am uh, lucky to uh, be invited to this uh, talk here today and uh, today we're going to be covering some of the uh, traditional items that you have in your collection and as well as a few of the items that I have here in my uh, own collection. <clears throat> um, I guess I'd like to start out by saying that uh, the, the, the art and the history of our nations between here in Minnesota and Michigan, the Ojibwe territory is kind of what I represent. and. Um, I've had a lot of really great teachers in my life and uh, a lot of what I have and what I know, um, I learned um, just by going to museums, you know, traveling to uh, the local museum here in Lac de Flambeau. And I think that was erected back in the early, late eighties, early nineties. When I remember when I first stepped foot in that museum, I was just blown away at, at like the uh, creativity that our ancestors had, you know, they had, the most beautiful birch pieces and they had um, just incredible works of beadwork and you know just natural fibers made from you know the land woven into these beautiful bags and just just incredible like uh, Ojibwe tapestries and just everything you can imagine you know and that was on display and as as the uh, museum was open over the next several years they had uh, repatriated items and we got to see more things come in, more things come in. And so our tribal museum, I owe a lot of, of uh, what I know to our local museum. And so once as a young man, I studied a lot of that information and a lot of the, the objects in there. I started traveling out to different museums. There was one north and six of, of Lac de Flambe here. It's called Saner, Wisconsin. They have a nice little Native American collection there that was donated by um, by uh, like wealthy landowners, you know, that came up here in the turn of the century and they uh, built their resorts and they had the native people working for them and they had acquired the pieces that way. Or, you know, we really don't know how some of the 
items were acquired. But that's what I did. I spent many years traveling around. I went to Green Bay, Chicago, Milwaukee, a lot of the other museums. And um, I got invited out to uh, the uh, Native American Museum in uh, DC and the uh, other one over in um, uh, New York. And mm -hmm. so um, I'll be doing that once this uh, pandemic kind of slows down or comes to a halt or whatever. But um, I, 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 uh, I spend a lot of time in museums. I research um, styles of the Ojibwe people. I research uh, even, I, I go as far as learning about native dyes and methods, you know, I, I pay real close attention to how things are constructed and made. So if you see me in a museum, well, you've seen it, Ben. Mm -hmm. I'll, take, I'll take I'll take the item and I'm looking real close at it. You know, I'm seeing how it was sewn and, you know, what it's made out of. And it's, uh, uh, I, I really enjoy doing things like that. And so when I went to the uh, Minnesota Museum there, I was uh, very fortunate to be um, led into the archive room with some elders the first time I went down. and. Uh, the things that we saw that were just incredible. And so I always remember that, you know, how welcoming you guys were to uh, myself and uh, an elder from White Earth and another elder from Red Lake. Yeah, I remember that visit. That was that was lovely. And that yeah. was probably five or 10 years. I mean, it's been a while. We've known each other for a while. Yeah. You've been here a few times. Always yeah. appreciate you visiting. And so the uh, the collection, you know, it, it gave us a broader perspective of of the talents and the um, the patience and the understanding our ancestors had of the natural world, and you know, as an artist myself, that's one of the areas where I'm I'm trying to get to that that area, you know. And I'm only uh, 44 years old, but um, I think by the time I'm 80 or 90, maybe I'll know a little something, you know. Uh -huh. And so I really appreciate you know the opportunities that. Uh, Especially recently, you know, museums have been opening their doors to uh, people that are interested in cultural things and cultural repatriation and things like that. So I think that that that's a big positive thing in, for for native communities. And I know a lot of uh, uh, local tribes around the area, northern Wisconsin area, and, and even in the ceded territory, they've been repatriating items and getting those items back. Like in our community, we we a lot of those items aren't just art objects, they're alive, they're considered alive in our language. Absolutely. And, and so we, we bring those, those what, what's considered art back into our ceremonies and, you know, they're released and, you know, uh, it's, it's really nice to see that once again, you know, thriving like it did long ago. And so um, I really believe that, um, you know, Minnesota State Historical Society is doing a really good job um, and definitely leading the way when it comes to sharing and uh, letting people check out what you guys have and what you guys have to offer and understanding. So I think that's really important that um, that you guys get a shout out for that because um, you know there's still a lot of private collections and, and public collections that they won't let anybody near any of their stuff. You know, even though it's it, it belongs to our, our people and our ancestors. You know, it's uh, it's it's very. It's becoming more common, I guess. I want to say, to have to run into people, and it's because of um, you know uh, places like the Minnesota State Historical Society. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. That's very, very kind. Um, and and we have a lovely team of people that I get to work with here, um, and also uh, within the last couple of years, we formed a Native American Initiatives Department that we still work closely with over here in collections. And I think, you know, we're just are gonna keep trying to do better and better and better. And, yeah. um, you know, you and I have talked about that before where we talk about repatriation of items going back to the community, but there's also the repatriation of skill sets and the repatriation of knowledge. And those are the things that artists like you come in and can can learn from, from collections. Um, I kind of wanted to talk what you're featured in the exhibit, uh, just a just a small panel right now, but it's about a project that you did in 2019 where you uh, did some cedar, you made some cedar mats. Um, and I think, I don't know, I don't know much about that process. I don't know much about mats, but I was wondering if you, um, I know we have a few pictures that we can share and I was wondering if you had a, a story or two to tell us about that. 
Sure. So I'll tell you a little bit about how that, that all came to be, you know, and uh, it, it, it was really, it was a really fun journey just learning about cedar that year. Um, like I said, I've been uh, doing beadwork since I was probably about 13 years old. That's when I started having a fascination with the way our ancestors did things. And so it just keeps growing and growing, you know, and so um, uh, when we, when we have our doings and we, we, we go that way, um, sometimes we make things out of cloth and, and uh, velvet and things that don't really they were just recently uh, brought in here in the past few hundred years but prior to that i was thinking well what did they carry the items in you know and so i started researching and i found out that a lot of that stuff was carried in, in basswood bags and natural fiber bags and cedar bags and um, nettle bags and so i thought well we already build canoes over in our community here. I, I assist uh, one of my teachers in building, help building birch bark canoes. And so I was very familiar with carving cedar and, and spreading out, um, splitting out the ribs, the waganok, and the, uh, you know, making um, things from cedar, ricing sticks, and you know, all the various things from cedar. And so a lot of the time that uh, cedar bark was actually kind of going off to the side, going to waste, you know. And it wasn't until I, uh, started researching it a little bit then I, I started gaining an understanding um well that that stuff can be used as well too and so um I, I would open up these books and i would see these beautifully woven cedar mats and because of my experience with bark and um other natural materials i figured why not dive into it a little bit and, and explore that and so uh what i did was one summer uh, a few years ago maybe five years ago, me and my son, maybe it was six years ago, me and my son, we uh, went and harvested just some bark. We went out and we, we were testing it every week. We tested, tested, and finally it was coming apart. And I knew that there's a season for it, just like there is with birch bark. Cedar bark, uh, the water and the sap travels up into the, into the top of the tree and it'll separate and it, it'll come apart easier. And so I found out, I, just by luck, I hit it just right, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, we wound up splitting it all out. And uh, we brought it home and split it out and set it on the ground. And we worked very, very hard on, on this uh, splitting. You know, there's my son in the center back there. And uh, that's one of my um, students. His name is Tristan. And he was he was on these journeys with us when we go harvesting bark. And so uh, what you see there is the bark that was freshly peeled off the tree. Now, before I knew this part, uh, I would just peel the bark off the tree and bring it home and process it at home. But there was an elder from out on the West Coast, and uh, she's a really well-known um, a, a weaver out that way. And mm -hmm. just, when you process your bark, don't do it at home. Do it in right in the swamp. Sit right there. Let the bugs drink your blood, and you know, let all that <laughs> make what you're offering. And so, what I wound up doing was taking that bark off. And she said, "There's a reason for that. You have." the asabakeshi the spider you have all these insects that live inside of the bark that's their home take mm -hmm. it off gently and set it at the base of the tree that way it'll stay in this environment and so we incorporated that that idea into our harvesting um ways and so now that we have this inner bark and we made sure that well there's nothing living in this inner bark you know and that's the part that we want to weave for the mats so we brought it home me and my son and I, I, I made this loom, this uh, weaving loom, and I, I saw enough photos to kind of get an idea how to do it. And all these photos were from turn of the century, you know, 19, 1910, 1920. And um, I was all ready to do it. I had my strips all lined up. And then I thought, you know, if I do it, nobody's going to care because I do this all the time. Now, if my daughter does it, she's nine years old. If she does it, now that's something. And so what I was I, I – I use social media to catalog her progress from start to finish. And that inspired so many people to see that. So I had my nine, that's her in the blue. Yeah. Right, in that photo. There we are. And now um, she's considered a, a, a master uh, um, mat weaver all over uh, Ojibwe country. And um, she's probably helped me with maybe a dozen mats. And, but it was funny because once we posted that um, online, she, uh, People were calling me and saying, can we hire your daughter to come teach our community mat? Yeah. Mat? And I was like, she only made one mat, you know? But So uh, we were catapulted as experts, you know, and we, are, we, we were and 
are by no means experts, but um, we're still learning the way. We're learning a, a lot more about um, dying, uh, the natural mm -hmm. dyes, and so I've been researching that. And so uh, every year we do two or three mats. You know, it's a lot of work. It's kind of like a birch bark canoe. Um, it's a lot of prep work. The weaving is the easy part. It's making uh, all those steps to, to, to getting there is, is work, you know. And just like all things in our culture for Ojibwe people, it's work. Making maple sugar is a lot of work. And, you know, um, making canoe, and it, it's all work, you know. It's all strenuous, like labor-intensive work. And so when I think about, you know, what our people had to do to survive and make a few dollars, you know, they, they really, they put their heart and soul into it for a couple of nickels, you know, and, yeah. uh, you know, hopefully times have changed and we don't have to live that way anymore. People can appreciate our hard work and our sweat and our, our, our blood that goes into making all these items, you know? And so I think that's, that's important to say as well. So, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, can you tell? Can you tell us what the mat was used for? Is it something that was used like in your home? Something you'd sit on? Yeah. So, cedar mats they had uh, various purposes in in our culture. So, one of the first uh, instances that I read about cedar mat was they were laid on the floor of the lodges. Okay. And if you think about it, cedar um, prevents moths and mm -hmm. a lot of other insects from from coming in. And so it was a deterrent for uh, all the little creepy crawlies in your home. But it also served, um, they would make fish drying mats out of cedar. And cedar is antibacterial and antifungal as well. So it's harder for bacteria to grow where there's cedar. And so somewhere along the line, our brilliant ancestors came up with that idea. And um, they utilized it. And that's how they uh, would dry their fish long ago. And the other one is the wild rice bags. You know, they yep. uh, they had storage bags, and then they had um, they had some of the uh, the mats that they would use to sit on uh, during ceremonies. You know, yep. I've yep. got a small bag from our collection here. Yeah, probably that, yep, probably a hundred years old. Yeah, that's yeah. a beautiful, beautiful example is. of uh, the uh, the twill weaving that our ancestors have done the the angle twill weaving, and so um. The cedar played an important role. It, it furnished uh, not only the wood for our canoes and our various other things, but it also gave us, our, our women, the ability to uh, weave these um, these uh, utility bags for our, our purposes and these mats and rugs and all these different things, you know. So um, if you go back in time, you'll see photos from our reservation. Um, some of the mats were nine feet long. And what they would do is when they would they would they would start weaving, they would have three or four people in a row, and one person would weave the top, the second person would weave the second line, and the third piece person would weave the third line. And so they were constantly switching back and forth. Yeah. And they could weave that in uh, just just under a day. And I experienced that. Um, there was a, a language camp up north, and they wanted me and uh, one of my elder friends to come up, and he was teaching birchbark canoes, and I was I, I taught cedar mat making. And so I never had enough people to experience what it's like to weave constantly throughout the day to finish a mat in one day. So I, I worked with these college students and I had this project where I had to weave this mat in, in like a five day period. We got it done in one day with these students and then we were all sitting around scratching our heads like, well, what are we going to do next? You know? So if you have a lot of people, it's, it's a group activity. Um, it can go faster. And then uh, usually there's some teachings that go along with that. So. That cedar weaving is just incredible. That's lovely. I had another I had another question. You mentioned um, using the cedar mat for drying and processing fish, which is like an amazing technology. But I also wanted to share that story about a couple of days ago when we had the pre we had our pre meeting, our check in, and we all logged in on our Zoom. And um, on your end, it was all black, and I was like, "What's going on over here?" And then I hear you zip. <laughs> you were out on the you're out on the ice, ice fishing. Yeah, yeah, we were harvesting muskies that day. So yeah, that's great. Do you can you tell me like is that's a that was a traditional thing that you're doing? Were you spearing or what were you up to? Yeah, we were using our wooden decoys, um, and we were spearing for for muskies. And so what happens is, um, uh, we take these wooden decoys that are made of basswood, and they're all painted a certain way, and they have uh, decorations on them and stuff to lure the fish in. And so what we do is we, we chisel a hole in the ice and we, we set our tent up. Today we use pop-up tents, but long ago, 
even in my lifetime, there were still people that were laying on the ice. They'd wrap up in blankets and chisel a hole in the ice, and then they'd lay on the blanket, and then they'd wrap themselves in a blanket and build like almost like a little teepee. Uh -huh. around them. What that did was that prevented um, light from distorting your view, and you could actually see bright down there and everything around you was dark, and they'd lay balsam bottles on. And they would jig that decoy up and down, and it would swim. And the idea of a fish decoy is that uh, it's going to uh, mimic a wounded fish and thus uh, calling in and uh, signaling to the uh, muskie that there's a basically a free meal. And that muskie sometimes will come up and it'll bite the decoy. Sometimes it'll check it out. But when he comes in there, that's when we uh, bojiboa, we spear that muskie. And uh, um, you're going to hear this a lot, a lot of people, especially online. Sometimes we'll share pictures of uh, muskies, you know, and all the Ojibwe people are happy, but some of the non-natives, they, they don't like to see that. And, you know, we're, we're like, well, what's the problem? Why don't you like to see this? And they say, well, we're sports fishermen sometimes here, but some people even say, they go as far as saying, well, muskie doesn't taste good. That's when we say, well, you just don't know how to cook, right? <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Well, you know what? And there are a couple other things that you are, have been talking about. And one of them, you know, you mentioned your daughter and your son and getting, and your students and sort of getting the next generation involved in this. And so, you know, I'm wondering, you've also mentioned that you've sort of, you have had to seek out opportunities to learn some of these art forms and some of these practices that they weren't necessarily readily available to you. You had to go to museums in, right. in some cases. What's it like for you to, to be able to pass that on to the next generation? You feel like you're participating in something kind of big or do you feel like, you know, cause from my perspective, you are, you and a lot of people are, you're, you're, you're bringing back some of these really important traditions and passing them on to the next generation that get to sort of grow up with them. Right. So if we, if we look at our timeline here on earth, we go back thousands of years to our creation story. And it was uninterrupted. Everything was always there. Everything was readily available. We were very, very wealthy people in, in that aspect. And then uh, when, when the boarding school came along, when alcohol came along and all these bad foods came along, a lot of that stuff was scrubbed out of our, our lineage and our, our timeline. And so uh, there we were. We were waiting. We were waiting for something, you know. And then uh, we realized that, you know, nobody's going to save us. Nobody's going to ride in on a white horse and hand us everything back and give us everything back. It's up to us to uh, take back what's ours and, um, and to teach what is truly, what truly belongs to us. When I was younger, a lot of things were pan Indian, you know, everything mm -hmm. we, we borrowed stuff from the Dakotas, we borrowed stuff from the Crees, we borrowed stuff from the Haudenosaunee, we borrowed from the Oneidas and the Menominees and everybody around us. But it's not like that today. Today, we have a very distinct, specific way that our people do things, you know, and we're sticking with that, and we're we're, we're staying with that, and it's the same with mm -hmm. all the other communities, you know. That uh, the whole pan Indianism idea is kind of it's it's left behind now. Tribes are individual tribes again, you know, and it's because of our, our research and because of our own people. We wanna we wanna continue to be Ojibwe because without the art form and without the language and without all those things. I'm just the descendant of somebody who used to call themselves Ojibwe, you know, but today we call that Anishinaabe when, you know, we get to live that way every day. And so that's the goal is to live that way every day and, and experience how our ancestors did. I have a nice home, but out back here we have a lodge. We have, we have a lodge made of sticks and uh, in the summertime it's going to get covered in bark. And so we have, we have the best of both worlds, you know. And so we are very blessed, very lucky today to be alive today. Yeah. yeah, that's lovely. And what you're doing is is pretty incredible. I know you're also a language teacher. Do you feel like the language, uh, do you keep do you, in your in your head, I guess, do you keep the language sort of separate from the art making? Is, you know, how are they related? Do you feel like they're complementary or, or um, yeah. how, how do they work together? The language is uh, tied right in with everything. You know, it's uh, it's interwoven just like our, our mats and our bags. Um, I'm still learning. I'm still. I'll be a student my whole life of the language. You know, and I, I was very fortunate to have a few uh, very wonderful teachers in my life. But um, the language is definitely woven into everything we do. And so, when I learn how to do something, 
if there's something about dyes or quill work or whatever, I always, I don't know those words. A lot of those words, you know, I just, but we'll do research. I'll ask my teachers. And if we don't know, then we go to these dictionaries that were written in the 17, 1800s. And we always retrieve this information, you know, and uh, a lot of things, uh, there's a language written about specific things like canoe building. There's a whole set of words and a language that's written around that. And mat weaving, there's a whole set of language and words written with that beadwork and so on and so forth, carving, all that, you know. Words that you would only find in those specific uh, constructs, you know. I think it's it's really important to understand that uh, our language is, is, is based on something being alive or not alive. It has a spirit or it doesn't, you know. And I think um, that, that's actually considered a spiritual language if you look at something, if it's alive or not. Mm -hmm. And so uh, our language teaches us about these things, these beads and these rocks and, you know, the tools that we need to make these things and why they exist. So, yeah, I think I think language uh, holds the keys to a lot of things with what we do as Ojibwe people. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I am wondering, I'm excited to see some of the things that you brought. I've got... I've got some historical uh, material culture here, but I really, I know you've got some uh, some beadwork and some even some fabric that you've designed, uh, some uh, containers, I guess, macaque that you've uh, scraped and, and that. Do you have them handy? Can we take a look at some of the Sure, yeah. So I, items? what I'd like to bring out first is, um, this is actually a, a uh, container that I made for one of my students that when I was teaching online courses. Mm -hmm. This right here is a birch bark basket and it's made from what's called winter bark. And um, what, what's interesting about this this kind of bark is that in the summer, if you peel the tree, it's that blondish orange color. But if you get it when the temperature goes down closer to freezing, the bark will actually come off and it'll have this, uh, this cambium layer kind of stuck to it. And so what you're doing is when you when you do your etching, you, you're actually revealing the summer bark underneath this stuff. And so this is a, a classic uh, art form for yeah. Ojibwe people. And so um, that is uh, how our people did it a long time ago. And it's so beautiful. I'm going to step away really quick and grab one. Sure. And so when I make baskets, I always try to um, I always try to emulate how they were done long ago. And so, yeah, that's the yeah. same thing. So what, what they did on that particular basket right there, a majority of it was scraped off and the, the floral was left on the dark. So it's kind of reverse of what I did here. Right. And so somebody made the basket and they sat there and they they uh, they painstakingly worked all that outer bark off, you know. And uh, long ago they had tools probably made of bones or maybe even copper or steel or something. But here's one that we are currently working on right now. This is This is a larger container. And so you oh, can lovely. see how the stuff is uh, scribed on there. And um, I'll give a quick demonstration on how to do it. Now, like I said, the tools long ago they had were probably made of bone or antler or something, but we use these little uh, etching tools mm -hmm. here. And I think we can get these almost like on, on like a uh, online or something. And so uh, you kind of see that right there, almost like a little knife blade. And so uh, what we do, is uh, we can get our container. Usually we do it because what happens is if you get this wet, if you just get this, the only part wet that you're working on, it's going to stain. And when you try, try to, uh, it's going to release, um, I forget what they call it, the tannin in here. It's going to release that tannin. And what's going to happen is you're going to have a streak on here if you get it wet okay. again. So we always try to, when, when we work on etching, we always try to get the whole container wet so it's all one color. But um, I'm going to give you a little demonstration here. So I brought I brought a, uh, a rag here, and I'm going to get this wet a little bit here, and I'm going to give you a quick demonstration. And so what I want to work on is maybe this, this leaf right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get that wet a little bit, okay, and I'm going to let that soak into that, okay. And so after it's scribed, what we do is we come in here with our, our tool and we just we just remove that, that bark layer, the outer bark. And you can see how that's revealed. And 
And so that's, yeah. It's a lot of work to uh, remove all that from. I was gonna say, and it sounds like you're you're applying like considerable pressure to it. You're sort of really scraping it. Is that right? Yeah. So what you want to do is you actually want to pe kind of peel it off so it'll come off in little tiny strips. Ah, and, I see. Yeah, and uh, you can see right there the. Uh, yep. That's the inner bark right there, and so um, that burst tree is is phenomenal. So it makes our canoes, it makes um, our containers, it covers our wigwams, it covers our lodges. And the other thing, what a lot of people don't know about birch bark is you have your bark, you have this inner layer that comes off uh, when you scratch it, but also the, 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 I believe it's the third layer, that right there, and then before you get to the wood, the, the heartwood of the tree, there's actually another layer. And I, I don't even know what they call that, but, um, that you can actually grind that down and make bread out of it. And uh, there's a lot of life in that tree. So if, let's, let's go back to the uh, cedar tree now. So what we do is we take the bark off the cedar tree, just like the birch bark. Mm -hmm. The birch bark is going to survive, okay, if you take a small portion off. But if you take enough for like a canoe, we usually drop the tree and take the bark off there for a canoe, okay. Now the uh, cedar tree, if we take the bark off, it's just going to die. Even if you take a little bit off, it's, it's not going to survive. And so what we do is we peel the bark off in strips as far as we can. We pull it off, and then we come back later that fall when it's time for ricing because that tree will dry out. And then we make our canoe ribs, and we make our um, we make our our uh, ribs, and we make our all of our uh, ricing sticks and things out of there. So that tree, it, once the bark comes off, we're going to continue to use it come back later and we mark it on our maps on our phones or we write them down somewhere and we say that we have this tree here and it's going to be good for you know whatever and then uh, we'll go back later and we'll cut that tree down and we'll use it so the whole tree gets used at some point you know and so that light that life that that tree had now gives Anishinaabe life through our artwork and our our ceremonies maybe we make ceremony objects with it or we knock rice with that to give our, our babies and our, our families food. So yeah, so that's uh, a little bit of the history on the, the, the tree. Um, the Now the birch tree, once, it, like say we go and we get enough for a, 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 a canoe, we mm -hmm. drop that tree and we have all that heartwood left. And what we do is we make paddles out of it and we make bowls and we do a lot with the rest of that tree. So that tree is uh, always used, you know, it's never, it's never left alone, so. Do you so? Do you feel like since we're talking about this, do you feel like there are um, specific Ojibwe sort of understanding of ecology, um, like traditional knowledge that you know? I've because I've heard people say before. I've heard non-natives say to people who are harvesting birch bark that said like you're killing that tree, yeah. and you know I've I've you know if that's not the case, if you do it right, you're not. And so right. I feel like there's this. There's this knowledge, and there's a different set of principles too in terms of uh, managing the natural environment. Right. So w what I've heard before from some of my teachers is that the birch trees are dying off because we're not using them. Okay. There's mm -hmm. only a few of us doing what we do. There's Pat Cruz over in Minnesota. You know, we have some friends in Upper and Lower Michigan. There's not very many people um, harvesting bark. We have some friends over in White Earth. Um, you know, we have a few of our friends up north, even some people over in the Colorado Rockies, they're getting the smaller birch trees that grow up in the Rockies. And what they're doing is they're, uh, they're um, experimenting with bark and, and utilizing bark, but it's just a few people. That mm -hmm. birch tree, I, I was told, it doesn't feel welcome anymore. We don't use it for our homes and, you know, we don't use it for our canoes. And so we, you have that spiritual side of it. But on the other side, you know, I, I've also taught classes where, um, I went to this one community one time. And they, they wanted to know how to make bark. They want to know how to harvest. So I go to their community. They take us to this. The DNR. The DNR says, "Yeah, you can go back here so so far, and you can mm -hmm. you can uh, peel these trees." So we go back there, and somebody went in there with a knife, and you can see what they were trying to do. They went in there and they killed every one of those birch trees because they didn't know how to take the bark off, and so it was just just a waste, you know. And so what that told me was that. Um, there was probably some hobbyist or somebody that saw 
bark and you ask somebody maybe how to do it and they, they give him a little they threw him a bone and said here's how you do it but he didn't know you know that there's a there's a certain depth you got to go and there's a certain way you got to make an offering to the tree and you know there's there's a little bit of a science to it and there's a little bit of spirituality to it and um you know these are the things that we teach our students and, and yeah and so you know i think it's important to learn before you go and do that to a tree you should definitely go with somebody that knows something you know yeah yeah so we um it's about 3 35 we're gonna keep chatting for a, a few more minutes and hopefully we get some questions um from the audience but you have, what else do you have to show us i have a pair of i had a really cool pair of mittens here that i wanted to show you and uh mm -hmm. Was wondering if you had any beadwork as well. Yeah, so um, I I have a, a piece that I had just re recently finished here. This is a uh, a large tobacco bag, and it's made with um, hand dyed wool inside here, and then the uh, military braid. Um, I dyed this myself, and then these are all vintage beads, antique beads, and um, it's lined with the calico, and uh, same with the pot. That is beautiful. Pot. It's lined with another. Yeah. And so what I try to do is I try to, to, to stay true to our uh, our style and um, you'll, you'll see a lot of the this type of uh, bag um, produced uh, long ago in lack of flambeau in our collections here and so um, this is a hide that me and my daughter had tanned up last uh, last summer I believe we made this hide and it came from a nice little dough and um, I, I held on to the side right here and so uh, we try to use Try to make things like our ancestors did long ago, and uh, I think it's uh, it turned out pretty nice. This one's actually going to a fellow over in Minnesota. Um, he's actually in the hospital right now, but uh, okay. he wanted uh, he wanted a little something for um, for himself. So this is going to go to him. Beautiful. Yep. And so uh, here is a uh, octopus bag that I made for my daughter. Ooh. Yeah, that is lovely. And this is all uh, wool and uh, vintage beads on there again. And this is uh, lined inside. And so uh, it has the tabs like they had. You know, this yeah. is this is a yeah. challenge for me to make because I remember uh, reading reading about these long ago. These actually come from a little further north, but they uh, the history of it, I guess the first bag was originally made in Alaska where they have actual octopuses. Octopus? Puss, octopi, or whatever. I think called. I think both are right. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, they uh, these bought these bags are modeled after them, and so mm -hmm. as that ca that caught on, um, it actually came down to the 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 uh, tribes over by Winnipeg, and then it caught on to the Great Lakes. So, mm -hmm. 16, 1700 style bags were made in this this fashion. So I said, you know, I was wanting to do one, so I made one for my daughter, and so uh, yeah. It actually has two straps on it, one for carrying around and one for the shoulder. So beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think we have we've got either two or three in the collection here. And um Dylan Miner from over in Michigan came by and, and looked at them one time. Yeah. Yeah. And so here's a bag that I, I, I made my uh my sweetheart. This is a what well so the name with this one. Long ago, it's called Ishkode Mushkumud, which is like a fire bag. They, they, mm -hmm. they used to carry their fire making kits in there. Use another style that I made for my my uh, partner, um, and this is made from wool and uh, hand dyed wool edging that I I did myself, and we wove a nice little strap for it. But these are all vintage beads, and um, you know we try to uh, stay true to our, uh, our 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 ways of uh, doing beadwork. You know. Yeah. That's beautiful. All mm -hmm. of those are beautiful. This is this is a bag I made for my son. So, wow. Yeah. Well, how about that fabric too? That you just you earlier you showed me a piece of fabric. Yeah. So um, one day I was uh, looking through some old magazines, old books, and there's pictures of these men and women, and they had this beautiful repeating calico pattern on their uh, on their clothing. And I thought, geez, wouldn't it be nice to, to redo something like that, but with an Ojibwe flavor, because those those uh, patterns were um, whatever was hot in uh, France or wherever mm -hmm. that came from at the time. Now, today, because of technology, and um, I'm also a graphic designer, mm -hmm. we have the ability to make our own fabrics, and it doesn't have to 
we don't have to have a whole complete run and spend thousands of dollars. So what I have here is um, I have actually a store online where I have uh, some of my own material that I sell. This is like a velvet that I designed and um, we can now put our own patterns on there, our own Ojibwe flair to uh, yeah. that. And so we can actually buy this in strips and then we can make shirts out of it and skirts and whatever you want, cradle pieces. And so um, I got into, met, met up with these uh, people and they um, kind of directed me like, well, you should just do this online. So I found this company online and uh, that's kind of how this all started. So I have probably about two dozen pieces online uh, of fabric that I designed. Some of them are repeating, some of them are okay. you can put on velvet and, and whatever. So yeah, I really enjoy designing that kind of stuff. So I love it. Do you, you know, and I knew you were a graphic designer, um, you know, because I remember just years ago seeing like a template that you made for uh, moccasins. Yeah. I think that was like one of the first things I saw from you. What do you do? You, uh, man, it just seems like you do a little bit of everything or a lot of bit of everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, like when, you, I was, um, when I was a kid, I, my, one of my goals is to be the editor for a newspaper. And um, growing up on, on, in Lac de Flambeau, opportunity came up to be a graphic designer for our local newspaper here. Oh, right on. So I, I applied for it, I got it, and I was a graphic designer for a while, then I eventually made it up to editor, so I got to live up my childhood dream. Right on. But um, that graphic design, uh, pursuing graphic design kind of gave me a platform for looking at how things are des designed and um, color, you know, color combinations, and mm -hmm. I'm really good at this program called Adobe Illustrator. I make the majority of my florals that you see in my, my patterns in, in Illustrator, you know. So I'm taking yeah. a, an old design and I'm making it contemporary with uh, with our new materials and stuff. So I think that was, uh, that that really helped me growing into the artist I am today, so. Wow, yeah. that's lovely. I, thank you so much for sharing all of this, all of your knowledge with us today. I think, um, we might have a couple questions that we could go to, and if we don't, we'll just keep chatting because we've got lots of stuff. Okay, Renee asks you, have you ever used berries and flowers for dyeing? I was gonna ask you that as well. Do you usually use commercial dyes or are you getting into some of the natural dyes as well? Yeah, we use a little bit of both. Um, if there's a project that I have to get done right away, uh, what I'll do is I'll use the writ dyes and the commercial dyes, but there are a lot of, um, I, I primarily use bark and roots for my dyes, for um, even the basketry. You know, there's these trees that grow inside the lakes. And um, I could tell you what those dyes are, but those are some of the things that we do when we we uh, we, we uh, take on our apprentices and we teach our youth what we want to do. We, we hang on to that kind of information, you know. And so we're really, we're really uh, mungy dug about that. We pretend we don't know a lot about it but we actually have uh, information, you know? So yeah, yeah we use a lot of, um, we use a lot of the uh, natural plants and uh, roots and stalks of plants, even some of the juices that come out of the berries and, and whatever, you know? Um, there's many, many different uh, types of dyes out there. Uh, oh, uh, one that I really, really enjoy using is blood root. It comes mm. out of the forest where you find your wild onions and um, the yep. wild roots and um, those, uh, those hardwood forests. And so what we do is we take that and we, we um, get as many as we can because you, the more the merrier. You can um, you can dry those out really good and then you can crush them and then you can make a tea out of them and that's where we dye our, our cedar strips, you know. And then there's different ways to dye quills, you know, and there's different ways to dye, um, different methods to dye different things, you know, uh, bulrush when we uh, work with bulrush too, so. Yeah. That's great. All right. Judy asks, where are museums that we can visit besides the Minnesota Historical Society? Wonderful artwork and interesting information. Uh, what, what are some of the other museums that you've been to in the region? I know you mentioned some in your community. Are there others regionally? Yeah, um, I haven't been there, but I heard that the, the Milwaukee Public Museum is just a, has a, it's just like the Minnesota State Historical Society. There's a lot of like really great um, Native American 
um, stuff in their collections. And then uh, there's this one that always sticks out in my mind. There's a, uh, I, I forget what it's called, the museum in Green Bay. And they have, I know they have a little dinosaur exhibit and all this and that there, but when you get to the Native American section, they just have uh, a display of the most fantastic uh, woodland beadwork. It's just all on display behind these glass cases. And one piece always sticks out in my mind. It's, I believe it's a Menominee Bay. And on there was this, uh, it had, uh, it had a, almost like a little American flag on the bottom, but right above it, it had the most beautiful beaded bird I've ever seen in my life. Really? And I've tried to make a bird similar to that. I don't want to copy exactly, but I've tried to do it and make it look as yeah. good, and I have just couldn't do it. You know, whoever made that that beaded bird was on another level. Yeah. And so, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, they're like they're like masters it's like looking at it's looking at masterful artwork from yeah and they didn't have the museum to to reference you know right we, right they, we still can't even touch those artists you know so right um you know i, I just personally will also put in a plug for a uh, shakopee cultural center the new one down there uh which is a dakota community a dakota run museum um and there's the Malax indian museum and it, you know, Malax. That's one of our partner sites. Yeah, we went up there when we went racing one time, and they let us. They let us downstairs, and we got to see their collection. And it was yeah. incredible. I was in, actually inspired by that museum as well. Um, a lot of the loom work they have in their collection. You know, I, I came home and worked really hard after, after I was in that collection. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, so. Diane is asking us, uh, asking you, you mentioned there's a season for collecting cedar bark. Right. What yeah. time of the year is this? And also do you use red cedar or white cedar? And so it varies, the, the time of the year varies because of regions. So if 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 the trees are popping up here, they're, gonna, they're not gonna be, they're already, already gonna be done in Southern Wisconsin. Okay. And then up, up by Grand Ray, Minnesota, th that, those trees are probably a few weeks behind ours. And so it varies from region to region, but the rule of thumb is, so when the uh, birch bark starts coming off the tree, when the sap is running, that is usually a sign of when the cedar tree is, is beginning to come okay. off. It's, it's, uh, it's bark, the bark will come off. So okay. I always judge it off the, the birch bark, so. Okay. All so right. The other one is when the mosquitoes start attacking you fiercely, ferociously. That's the other sign, so. All right, okay, so we have a question that asks, uh, Roberta asks, are narratives important to your work? Are stories important to your work? And uh, can we hear one for the moss bag, which? Yeah, well, a, a little bit of what I know about the moss bag, I'm not very, um, I know that when we do our cradle boards, um, we have one that's attached and it's kind of woven on or nailed on, but the, the moss bag, I believe the one that you're referring to in the question, um, those actually come from more of the Northern communities. Um, you'll see those from Saskatchewan all the way over to Thunder Bay and then across. A lot of those communities, they use moss bags, maybe even some of the Northern um, Minnesota tribes. And um, I believe they're called a moss bag is because and this is before pampers and diapers what they would do is they'd fill the bottom line the bottom of the bag with moss dried moss and moss will expand like 300 percent you know before it's not able to use and what they would do is they would take the moss out and they would dry it up and it would it would shrink down again and so that was a real uh, interesting uh natural resource to use for our, our babies as well so i believe that that's a little bit of the story that i'm familiar with but like I said, you'd probably have to go talk to somebody in those communities. I really don't know too much about the moss bags. Well, so how about sort of beyond that particular question, are are there stories sort of that are passed down? Are there are there cultural stories that are important to tell that accompany when you're teaching somebody the the art form? Yeah, there are like like with, with harvesting cedar, you know, um because that, that wasn't gifted to me. That wasn't gifted to me by any of our, our old people. Um, oh, I think prior to my daughter making that bag, it, there was a 70 year gap between when she made that, that cedar mat up until um, the last elder that ha held that knowledge passed away in her community. So there was a big gap there and a lot of that information wasn't, wasn't brought forward. Well, so what we do is 
we fill that with our, our traditional stories about how the cedar was made or um, even if we're doing maple sugar, how uh, one of our, our, our create, creating, a, 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 one of our, in, in our creation story, there was a, 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 one of our, the nephew to the Ojibwe people, his name was Winnebuju, how he created maple sugar for the Ojibwe people. So we have those stories that came down to our, our knowledge, but for the ones that we have a gap of, um, of uh, history erased, we, we usually try to fill that in with something, you know, but yeah, stories are important with the passing on of, of that type of knowledge, so. That's great, thank you. Um, let's see, what time of year do you harvest the winter bark? Good question. And, yeah. Is so the, it, it, it does peel off. Um, you, you actually have to muscle it off. Like in the summertime, if you stick your knife in the bark and you take it off, it pops right off. Mm -hmm. But the uh, winter bark, you actually have to wait until it's closer to freezing. That's why we call it winter bark, because there's usually snow on the ground when you do harvest it. Um, and so like uh, the the warm winter days when, when the, the uh, thermometer gets above 32 and it starts climbing into the 40s and the sun is beating on the tree, the, that's the time you can actually go and harvest that winter bark. But once it come, once you start it, you get you have to work your knife to start it, and you actually have to muscle it off. You have to actually have to use a lot of force to push it off. That's why you don't see a whole lot of, of winter bark um, out there in, in people's collections because it's so difficult to get. You know, you have to work very hard to get a small clear piece because a lot of it likes to stick and peel. And you can see that on this, even this piece right here. Um, there's a piece right there that actually stuck to the tree and it came off. And so what mm -hmm. we what we try to do, oh, actually, it's right here. So we can, um, we try to build our art around those or, or inside of those. And so, you know, a lot of that stuff is just natural. That's the natural um, cycle of the tree. And so some of us, we, we just incorporate it into our artwork. But, um, yeah, it's um, temperature. Uh, the te the uh, temperature plays a big role in the time of harvesting bark summer and winter so okay but before you peel a tree i would recommend that you, you spend some time with somebody that actually does it so because you could really hurt that tree so oh man here comes megan with an, a lovely question and it's about indigenous food and i know you are uh always making something so first of all megan says you mentioned disruption in indigenous diets due to colonization are there indigenous restaurants or brands that you support and recommend? And then I got to follow up to be like, what do you, what do you do on the daily? What do you eat? Cause I know you're, you're often you're hunting, you're often you're fishing and yeah. you're harvesting and gathering and yeah. So to answer Megan's question, um, I think the best restaurant in the world is the restaurant outside. Okay. So we harvest our food from the land. The majority of the time I would like I would like to say um, maybe 40 to 50 percent of what we eat we harvest you know which is pretty good mm -hmm. um, we harvest ourselves we have a lot of wild rice we have a lot of venison we can our own venison um, and uh, the best the best places to get wild rice and venison is from your native hunters and your, your native fishermen um, and I remember, uh, there, the, I, I haven't been to too many um, Native American restaurants. The only ones I've really been to that were anything like a restaurant were at Palo stands, where they have, uh, you know, those little uh, those little stands where they, they have different types of food and soup. But as far as um, an actual Native restaurant, I, I personally have never been. I know there's one in Minneapolis. I know there's one in uh, Detroit. I know there's one in Toronto. But I really yeah. don't know about as far as restaurants go. And um, I'm sure that there's a lot of places online, like a lot of the corn that I get, I get from the Oneida people. We grow our own corn and we make our own hum mm -hmm. as well. But the um, I'm always getting gifted uh, corn from the Menominee, or not the Menominee, but the Oneida tribe. Um, they have a lot of their white corn. And then we have our friends down in uh, lower Michigan. They, they bring us the uh, Flint corn. And you know, we have a lot, of, a lot of people that bring that kind of stuff in. So. Um, we usually trade for that kind of stuff. So maybe they come up here and they, because you can't eat the fish in lower Michigan, but up here we fish. So what we do is we trade, we trade for those items and that's usually how we do it. So, Yeah. 
That's awesome. What's your what is your favorite native dish? What's your favorite Ojibwe traditional food? I like, believe it or not, I like boiled fish. I like yeah. boiled fish. Yeah. And it's so good, you know, it's so good for you. And um, you know, I, I also like maple sugar. I love maple sugar. Uh-huh. You know, it's it's we put it on everything. So today we have um we have salt. There's all the salt, 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 and everything. You know, uh, there's salt in our fish. And but what we've switched to in our community is instead of using salt now, we use sugar. We use maple sugar like you did long ago. So when we process and we smoke our fish, we use maple sugar. Uh huh. With um, we we bake things. We don't use white sugar too much anymore. We use maple sugar. So it's really important to keep that going too because that's what that's what our bodies are used to. We can actually digest that that sugar. You know. Well, that's great. I was gonna say too this this uh, macaque that I held up earlier. This is full. This is packed full of sugar. This is all yeah. probably you know seventy, eighty, maybe hundred year old maple sugar in this one. And you know what happens uh, with maple sugar? As time goes on, it'll get harder and harder, and it'll actually turn into like almost like a, a piece of crystal. Yeah. What happens is um. What's cool about that is what they did long ago is they made these things called shishiguan sun, which are like little cones of birch bark what they would do is they would turn them over and they would fill the uh the the cone up with sugar and they would hang like bunches of them up in their house and over time they would actually crystallize probably like that one and whenever you walk by you would hit it and it would almost sound like bells little little, uh chimes you know sweet so it was called almost like a little rattle you know it was yeah and then we've done that before we've and when people come over we cut one down and give it to them as they're partying or whatever you know that's great. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, we got a couple more questions. We've got f- about three more minutes. We'll see. Okay. Could you describe some fun winter games? And thank you for sharing with us today. Sure. Yeah. Winter games are a big part of what your boy culture. They had yeah. a book called Guni Kaganavik, which is a snow snake. Mm-hmm. What they would do is they would they would bank up snow into this almost like a pyramid, and then the men would come and they would drop a big log right on there, and they would pull that log, and it would actually create like a half tunnel all the way down there. And sometimes it would go one, uh, three, or four hundred yards, and these men would make these long sticks out of different types of wood, and um, they would be weighted on the end. Somebody would use like molten lead. They would pour in the top or they would insert stones or whatever. And it was always a secret how these people made and they greased up their snow snakes. And they would actually, there'd be wagers and there'd be songs and there'd be betting going on with all the, the spectators and what they would, they would wager goods like maple sugar and whatever and um, blankets. And maybe sometimes they'd have a little bit of money and all these side betting would happen. And then these people would throw these snakes and they would, see who who would win you know so that was one of the games um a lot of them that we do around here we have snowshoe racing we have what's called um uh, a pick minoage magen, which is almost like a hoop and spear game we would, we would roll this big hoop almost like a dream catcher we would throw it and then the young men and women would try to throw a spear and there's certain parts of the the target that were color coded and they would represent a buck a doe one and a yearling and then you know you would, you would add up your uh, your, your tally with sti- sticks or whatever. Then there was also a boxing game, which was which was uh, held uh, during big events around here as well. So yeah, that's great. And I almost forgot. You know, we were had this winter winter stuff going on here, but um, I grabbed a couple pairs of of uh, snowshoes, and I was going to ask you, have you ever made those? Um, I personally have never made snowshoes, but one of my teachers has, and uh, I've okay. witnessed how he um, he does his weaving. So I'm really familiar with uh, the weaving patterns, and um, I make cradle boards and um, different things with ash, and I know how to steam and bend them. And that's yep. one of the next things on my list is uh, making uh, traditional Ojibwe snowshoes. Great. Well, you should come down here and check out what we've got. Yeah, for sure. Totally. Yeah. Well. I was talking oh, to my teachers earlier today, and I was talking about coming here and, and doing this, you know, with you guys today. And he says, "You make sure that you tell Ben that we want to come down for spring break." So, <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be glad to have you. Things are a little bit different. We're we're doing some social distance kind of stuff, but uh, we're absolutely glad to host you. Okay. And it looks like we were getting really close to the end of our time here and so i wanted to mention i think there, there might be a survey that pops up 
uh, in the comments and our audience is, is uh, encouraged to do that. We also have another program coming up on March 25th, and that's Dr. Kate Bean, who's gonna be speaking with Cole Red Horse Jacobson about his uh, artist in residence here at, at the Historical Society. And man, I can't thank you enough. It is so nice to chat with you, and I feel like I could talk for, could listen to you for another four or five hours here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, I really, like I said, I really like the collection you guys have there. Yeah, well, thank you. Really appreciate it. Sure. And um, all right.